Let's get right into the Word of God this morning, the book of Hebrews chapter number 9. We're going to read a lot of scripture today. I trust you have your Bible. We're doing back to the basics, and there's nothing more basic in our belief today than the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? It cleanses us from all sins. It washes us. And though there are many, many people today, many, many, quote, churches, unquote, many, many preachers today that don't want to preach on the blood, I'm here to tell you, I am thankful for the blood. For without the blood, as we'll read in just a minute, there is no remission for sin. Hebrews chapter number 9, let's begin reading in the very first verse. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the table, the candlestick and the table and the showbread. And if you were here on Wednesday nights years, uh, years ago, uh, months ago, we actually studied all of this. And the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the, the tables and the, of, the, of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year. Underline this phrase, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors or the sins of the people. Now the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as yet the first tabernacle was standing, which was a figure from, for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him uh, that did service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. I love verse 11. But Christ, being come and high priest. Now draw your line out beside there, and this is not in my notes for this morning, but I'll go ahead and give it to you. Draw your line out beside verse 11 and write chapter number 8. Because in chapter number 8, you have our, our high priest is powerful, our high priest is permanent, our high priest is perfect, and praise the Lord, our high priest is patient. Amen? So Christ has become our high priest. And of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Look at verse 12. Neither of the blood of goats and calves, but by, read that out loud with me, his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, and notice, circle that little word once, into the holy place, having obtained, circle the words, eternal redemption for us. And everybody shouted, Amen. look at that. He went once into the holy place. Now, in just a few minutes, we're going to go to the book of Leviticus, chapter number 4. And we're going to find that every year, yea, every day, blood was shed at the altar. Blood was shed at the tabernacle. Every day, the blood, the, the priest was covered with blood. Every day. Their garments was covered. Every day the veil was covered. Think of the gallons and gallons and millions of gallons of blood that was shed back then. And then remember this. It wasn't good enough until Jesus shed his blood on Calvary. Every year the high priest had to go in. But not anymore. Oh, by the way. If you couldn't lose your salvation, you'd have to be, Christ would have to be crucified again. But he entered once into the Holy of Holies. Amen? 
Keep that in mind. Now let's read. I'm not supposed to be preaching. I'm supposed to be reading. Okay. That's just good stuff. But by his own blood he entered once. Oh, I done read that. I think we need to read it again. By his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained, oh, I love it, eternal redemption. How beside that you ought to write John. Do you know that the word everlasting and eternal is used 36 times throughout the whole book of John when it, re, when it, re, it is regarding our salvation? Not one time does anywhere in the Bible does it say you can lose it. I am so glad. Because folks, I don't have some time, I don't have all timers, I got some timers. Sometimes I can't remember nothing. My wife will tell you, I don't lose my keys one time a day. I do not. I lose them five or six times. Those of you that are around here, you know I never lose my phone one time a day. I lose it seven or eight times. The other day, Belinda came walking in. Preacher, you find your phone? No, she said, good, here it is. <laughs> oh, man. And, and I know for sure that if I could lose my salvation, I'd forget where I lost it and wouldn't be able to go back and get it. I am glad I can't lose it. And that it is eternal, no matter what I do. For if the blood of bulls and go of goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You're not saved to sin; you're saved to serve. Okay. That sermon's over. Verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, they which were called might receive the promise of what? Say that out loud. Oh, I love the word eternal. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a tester. For a testament is of a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the test, testator liveth. Whereupon, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Underline that phrase. He sprinkled the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and the vessels. So the book, the people, the tabernacle, and the vessels of the ministry. And he said this, Almost all things by the law purged with blood. Understand this. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Let's read that out loud together. Without shedding of blood is no remission. There is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. You go back to the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and had disobeyed God and partaken of the fruit. They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves because they were Ray Stevens. Are you naked? They were naked. And God said, who told you you was naked? And the, Adam said, that woman. <laughs> and the woman said, the serpent, and the serpent looked around, and there wasn't nobody to blame, but the devil, and the devil looked around, and there wasn't nobody to blame. It was just him. But you know how they got that covered? They didn't cover it with fig leaves. They didn't cover it with good works. They covered it with the blood of an innocent lamb. Amen? Grab that truth. When Cain and Abel fought, they fought because Abel brought a more perfect sacrifice. What did he do? He brought blood. Cain brought works of his hands. Remember this, my friend. You cannot be saved by works. If you could, who set the standard for how much works is right and how much works is wrong? 
If you can lose your salvation, who set the standard as to what point you sin? And here you hit this sin, you lose it. But up to here, you don't. So you can go this high and you'll be all right. That's why you can't lose it. Amen? It's under the blood. We'll find that out again here. Just I may never get to my message. Okay. It's all right. I got two more Sundays. We're doing this basic stuff. We're good. Now, where are we? Oh, verse 23. This is where it really gets good. I mean, folks, this is so cool. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heaven should be purified of the, with these things, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Now, before you get too confused, the tabernacle, the holy of holies, where the altar was, was a picture of what's in heaven. Okay? Hang on. That's what's in heaven. When you study in the book of Numbers where God did that, God told Moses, now I want you to pattern it after the things in heaven. And God told him exactly how to do it. So in heaven, there is a holy of holies, there is a mercy seat where the blood had to be sprinkled. Every year, the high priest would go in and take the blood, and he'd sprinkle it on the altar. And that would roll their sins forward. But God said, whoa, wait a minute, that was earthly. When we get to heaven, there's got to be a better sacrifice. <laughs> you know what that better sacrifice is? It's the blood of Jesus. Remember, hang on, remember, Mary ran to the tomb, and it was empty, and Peter and John ran, and then they left, and Mary turned, and she saw the, the, what she thought was the gardener. And she turned and she said, where have you laid my Jesus? And Jesus just simply said this, Mary. And she recognized it. And she went, oh, master. And she lunged at him. And he backed up and said, don't touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Remember that? Sometime between the time then and the time that he looked at Thomas and said, Here, buddy, touch my hand, touch my side. Sometime between then and then, Jesus went back to Calvary, and I don't know how he did it. He's a whole lot better than servo master. He went to Calvary, and he took all of the blood that was shed, and he carried it to heaven, and there he placed it on the mercy seat for you and me. For me, And now we have the better sacrifice in heaven because it was a perfect blood by a perfect individual and now it becomes a perfect sacrifice. Amen? Amen. So now we have, not with the blood of goats and of calves, but with the blood of Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness of all our sins. Now hang on, hang on. How many of y'all were alive when Jesus died? Nobody? And yet, are you ready? His blood that he shed back then still covers your sin today. And it covers the sin before you got saved. It covers the sin after you got saved. And it covers the sin for the future. So it's past, it's present, and it's future. And it's the blood of Jesus, not your good works, that covers it. Amen? So, he entered in and he went once into the holies and he did that. Verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. When God sees us, he sees the blood. Oh, now wait a minute, folks. I know you're Baptist, but if that don't stir your heart, your stirring stick's broke. Let me say that again. God doesn't see us. He sees the blood. Amen. Okay. Y'all don't go to sleep on me yet. I ain't started preaching. You can go to sleep when I start preaching. That'd be all right. Verse 24 said he appeared in the presence of God for us. Verse 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself Often? In other words, he don't got to do it over and over and over and over again. 
as the high priest did into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now circle this verse, word once. Say it out loud. Once. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. Do you really believe it? But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of your good works. Oh, by the sacrifice of your church membership. By the sacrifice of the money you give. Oh, it says, by the sacrifice of what? Say it again. Himself. And as it had appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Verse 28, read it out loud with me, please. So Christ was offered, offered. Let's try that again. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for giving us this precious love letter that shows us your will and your way. Now as we study just a little bit, open our hearts and our minds and our eyes, that we may not just see, that we may not just hear, but that we may understand the true sacrifice that was made on Calvary and what the blood really means. In your precious name, we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Leviticus, turn with me please to chapter number 4, and I'm going to go fast this morning, and if I don't get it done, that'll be all right, because we already got the reality that we're washed in the blood. Amen? Amen. Say, I'm washed in the blood. Say it again. Say, all my sins are forgiven. All my past, present, and future. That's what we want to see. But remember, it's not. It is not by you or by me. It is by the blood of Jesus. Amen? Now, Leviticus chapter number 4. Leviticus is a book that not many preachers like to preach out of. It's dry, it's dull, it's boring. People don't like to read it. It's got laws, it's got do's, it's got don'ts, it's got would-haves, it's got would and nots, it's got should-haves, it got should and nots. It said, oh man, why did I... The book is really difficult to read and understand. But when you look at the first portion, I'm going to give this to you real quick. In chapter number one, okay, in chapter number one we have the offerings that are there. In chapter number one is the burn offering. In chapter number two you have the meal or the grain offering. In chapter number three you have the peace offering. Now somebody said it was this way, love, joy, and peace. Now I'm not sure how that goes, but I do know this. If you love the Lord, you have love, joy, and peace. If you washed in the blood, you have love, joy, and peace. If you live in freedom, you have love, joy, and peace. Amen? But then you come to chapter number four. Now, this is a strange chapter because it says here, beginning in verse number one, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and shall do against any of them. And if the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin which he hath sinned a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin Offering. Now, I'm going to stop right here. And somebody said, well, preacher, how can you sin without knowing it? Now, here's what I'm glad for. I am glad I live under grace and not the law. Because God's grace is sufficient for all my needs. But if I was living under the law, and and I'll tell you this, you've heard me say it before. I'm glad I wasn't a high priest in the Old Testament. They had, are you ready, 613 laws they had to abide by. And we can't even drive 75. 
We can't even put a seatbelt on. Hello? <laughs> oh, come on, folks. You know that's true. We, we have trouble keeping the big ten. He said, what's the big ten? Go to Exodus chapter 20 or Deuteronomy chapter 5 and you'll find the big ten. They're called the Ten Commandments. And we have trouble keeping them. Can you imagine having to keep 613 laws? Can you imagine being a high priest and having to know that if you did this sin, I had to do this, and if you did this sin, I had to do that, and if you did this sin, I had to... Folks, y'all be in trouble. I can't even remember where I was yesterday much less how to sacrifice for 613 laws. So it's no strange fact that God said, there are sins of ignorance. You just didn't remember. And you did it, and you wasn't supposed to did it. Now here's what I find out in this chapter, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to go pr pretty quick in this, and Hopefully I'll get halfway through my message. It's for everyone. The priest, the people, the rulers, and the pauper. It's for everyone. Now, how many of y'all are priests? Okay, you don't know it, but you are. That's okay. After the, never mind. How many of y'all are people? Few of y'all are. <laughs> the little boy was talking to his friends. And he's talking about how children were born. And so they all went home and asked their parents, how was you born? One said, the stork brought me. The other one said, I just showed up. The other one told them the story of, of real. And they all got together and they said, man, our parents are crazy. One said a bird brought me, and I know better. Anyway, okay. You're people, right? You're a prince, and you're a pauper. But you're also a child of the king. So wherever you are in life, this is the cool thing. Maybe not so, but this is reality. You're a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. We are all sinners. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin? So death is passed upon all men in that all have sinned. So if you're a sinner, say amen. amen. Of course we are. But here's the cool thing. Here's the cool thing. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all sin. Now that little word cleanse, if you, if you want to go over there to 1 John 1, 9, it says, that's what it says, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses of all sin. That little word cleanses, you know what it means? It means it continually cleanses. It's continually making us clean. It is perpetual. It is always washing our sins away. Amen? Amen? Now, everyone sins and no one is exempt. Also understand this. Everybody needs a sacrifice for their sin. That's why in the Orient they will crawl on their knees. That's why in the Orient they will beat their back. That's why they will actually, and they do this in some places, hang people on a cross, trying to find forgiveness of their sins. You know that if, if I told you today that all you have to do to go to heaven is go outside, get on your knees, and crawl around this building seven times because the number seven is completion. And after you've crawled around this building on your knees seven times, you're saved and you're going to heaven. If I told you that, if you got out here at midnight or one or two in the morning, you'd find somebody trying it. But if I tell you, all you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved, you'll look at me and say, oh, that's too easy, preacher. 
That's too easy. Well, it may be easy for us, but it wasn't easy for God. It may be easy for us, but it wasn't easy for the Son. Because you see, before the foundations, as we read earlier in the book of Hebrews, Christ said, I will become the propitiation for your sins. Don't get confused about that big word. It just means I'll die for you. That's what it means. And he literally became sin for us, according to 2 Corinthians. He became sin for us, even though he knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And everybody said, wow. Everybody needs a sacrifice. What are you trusting in? Well, I'm a good mom. Yeah, but that's not going to get you to heaven. Well, I'm a good dad. I know it. Not going to get you to heaven. I had the privilege of doing a service yesterday for a Stan Butler. If anybody knows Stan Butler, this is what I was talking about. I told him, I said, he was an old school man with old school ways and old school thoughts. As a matter of fact, he was a modern day Archie Bunker. I told him he was a good man, a good mom and a good dad. But that's not why he was in heaven. He's in heaven today because he placed his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the only way. There's no other name given under heaven whereby man must be saved than at the name of Jesus. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man come to the Father but by me. We need a sacrifice. And God knew that. So he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus was willing to leave the portals of glory and come to this earth and live a perfect, and it's important, a perfect, sinless, spotless life. Let me say that again. He lived a perfect, sinless, spotless life. Not only did he not sin, he could have not sinned because he was God in the flesh. You know what it means to be perfect? To be perfect means to be lacking something. Jesus isn't lacking anything. And that's why he's the perfect sacrifice. And that's what Hebrews was telling us. He's the perfect sacrifice. So God laid out the plan for the sacrifice. And it's all centered around a little five-letter word. We sing this old song, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Amen. But there's another verse that says, the B-L-O-O-D, that Jesus shed for me. I wish I could remember the rest of the words, but it's the B-L-O-O-D. Amen. It's the blood that Jesus shed for us. It's all centered around the blood. We think today of churches that have removed the blood songs out of their hymnals. I'm so glad today that every song that was sung from the time we started to the time we finished was about the blood of Jesus. Say, well, preacher, why is the blood so important? Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Tommy Druitt, my wife's favorite singer in the entire world, he's old now, and I can out-sing him finally, but his wife, Jeannie, wrote a song. And this is what it said. That old cross was stained with the precious blood of my Jesus, where he died for me in awful agony. My poor human mind, it can't comprehend such mercy. But I'm so glad that he chose to go to Calvary. For without the blood, I'd never know my Savior. Without the blood, I'd be lost 
eternally and without the blood I'd never go to heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood he shed for me. Today I ask you, what are you trying to cover your sins with? The fig leaves of the garden? The good works of Cain? Or the precious blood of Jesus? He loved you. He died for you. He'll save you. He'll wash away all your sins and make them as white as snow. He'll make you a child of the King. He'll redeem you and ransom you, give you a home in heaven if you'll come to Him.